Okay. So the cell cycle, we, we know all the parts of the cell. We know what the tissues are. We know the basic macromolecules. We know about cellular transport and you know about the organelles. So the cell itself has a nucleus right? and the DNA only stays in the, the nucleus. So this is the miracle right here, the DNA molecule, that double-stranded nucleic acid with those base pairings that you learn. It has to replicate itself first. And this is gonna take a lot of enzymes, right? A lot of enzymes. First, you gotta break the big hydrogen bonds. They're weak. Like you told me on the exam, the hydrogen bonds are what holds those big 3D structures together, like the two strands of DNA, right? So the DNA, I think you got a good idea, carries the genes, which is really, it is the genes that are passed down through from chromosomes to generation to generation, All right? So enzymes, really important in creating these things. Enzymes are catalysts, enzymes lower the energy of activation. So it creates a fork, that's, that's well said, right? So it breaks the bond between the two nucleotides, A, T, C, G, right? DNA is A, T, C, G. So here's one of the enzymes, it's called DNA polymerase. And that attaches the A, T, C, G, right? So that's kind of exposing the strand. And then two new molecules are made. And I don't know that this, this part right here, I don't know how that happens, but it takes energy. It takes a process. So it is a replication of DNA, semi-conservative, if you will. So that's replicating itself, basically. This is not mitosis yet. This is, this is actually the phase of the cell cycle. Like you're gonna, you're gonna see the cell cycle and that only involves mitosis. As mitosis, you know, is the cell division or the nuclear division of the cell. So most of the time, like say, like say, say it's a perfect cell, like in a, in a, and we're involved in a 24 hour cycle. So most of the time, the cell is in, in what's called interphase. And that's not even mitosis. An interphase is what the cell normally looks like, like the cell we've been looking at. Okay, you can see the nucleus, you can see the nucleolus. You can see chromatin, right? Which like on the test was DNA and histone protein, but you can't see chromosomes. You could see the, I mean, again, with the microscope, you could see the cell membrane, you could see the cytoplasm and the nucleus. But if you look closer, you could see the mitochondria. You could see the vesicles, the lysosome, the smooth and rough, endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus. So an interphase, it's like a city working, doing all its usual jobs. So there's three phases of that. There's G1, which is a growth phase when things are getting built, right? Like the uh, proteins, like your phospholipids, your steroids, whatever that cell is designed to do, because not every cell is the same. That's why we study those four tissue types, right? Muscle tissue, nervous tissue, epithelial tissue and connective tissue. So each one of those cell types within those tissues has different functions. And of course the, the anatomy mirrors the function. So the growth, it depends on what it needs to do. And then there's a phase, an interphase called S and that's this, this is DNA synthesis, DNA polymerase. So this is when DNA is being built and replicated on itself. This is a miracle really is, and this, this is the basis behind all our proteins, as we saw in protein synthesis. And then there's a G2, and it happens in that, in that order. G1, growth, then we have a, the longest period actually is the synthesis, and the most important, I think, is the replication and synthesis of DNA. Then G2 is the phase right before mitosis, and mitosis is four phases. You're going to see P PMAT, PMAT, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And, and for, again, I'm trying to keep this nice and tidy for you, but PMAT is only an hour of, of say, a 24 hour day. We'll just say one hour. So the rest interphase is the 23 hours 
of that day and the life of a cell. And that whole thing is a cell cycle. So this is mitosis down here. That's PMAP. And remember, we're talking about somatic cells, not gametes. So the somatic cells are anything besides the sperm, which is called the spermatozoa, or the egg, which is called the oocyte. So they undergo what's called meiosis, which we'll see at the end. So this is for somatic cells. Somatic cells are diploid, 46 chromosomes. I went through this last time, I think. With, and that's 23 pairs, so 22 autosomes. Paired, pairs of autosomes, 22 pairs. And then you have one pair of sex chromosomes, which carry DNA as well. Okay, so the female has the two X looking chromosomes and the male has X and a little dinky Y. Right? So that's really important. And this 46 chrom chromosome somatic, uh, somatic cell is called diploid. It's really worth repeating this. Diploid, they sometimes they, they write it as 2N. I'm really bad at writing lowercase n's, but that's 2n. means they have 23 pairs of, of chromosomes, diploid. If it was haploid, like a sperm or an egg is haploid, that would just be written as n. And that's just 23 chromosomes, not pairs. So just to get you used to that, so haploid is a sperm or egg, and that's just the 23 chromosomes. Sperm. Nucleus, oocyte, nucleus. But all the ones we're talking about in mitosis and cell cycle are somatic cells, which are diploid. 23 pairs of chromosomes. So 46 total. So you can remember that. You'll always remember that. Okay. I have a quick question, Professor. Yes, Angelina. What's up? Um, sorry, you compared the um, mitosis to like one hour of 24 hours. And I was just curious, like how long does the actual process of cell division oh, take? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to get into that. So let, let me go back to that phase. I didn't want to talk too much, but that's true. So here's what could happen. Now, well, let me ask you this. This is a really important question. What tissue of the four we mentioned before, which tissue undergoes the most mitosis? Like let's going to speed through this even faster than 24 hours out of, you know, um, connective tissue, epithelial muscle or nerve, which one is, goes the most? So on the muscle? No, it's epithelial. Epithelial tissue undergoes the fastest and most mitosis. Think of your epidermis of your skin, that stuff that just sloughs off. Like we've been sitting here, like I turned on the Zoom session a couple of minutes before 2.30. We've probably lost 500,000 cells because of the mitosis that's going on in our skin, epidermis. So we're building new cells and we're losing the old ones that are dying. So epithelial is the fastest mitosis. So that, that day could be, you know, some of those basal cells, they, they could be taking an hour, the whole, the whole cycle in an hour, over and over. So the, what do you think is the least mitotic? This is kind of a hard question then. But if, if you look generally, the least mitotic is gonna be nerve tissue. So nerve tissue, they kind of go into G1, right? And then there's a phase in here called G0, like a stopping of, of the cell cycle where it just stops and that's the end of it. So Angelina, that, that could be from the time you're one years old forever. It never gets to PMAT. And that's completely appropriate for something like a nerve cell. Connective tissue has sparse cells, so they're different. And some of them, you know, like a macrophage could last a little bit longer. Uh, a red blood cell doesn't have a nucleus, so there's no mitosis at all. Make sense? White blood cell may take three days to turn over because they're pretty, pretty, make, you know, they're, they're mitotic in the bone marrow. So the, that hour thing is kind of uh, variable. So some stop. 
And even in regular mitosis, you, you, you don't want it to go too fast. So it has to pause. So let's think about that. Like, like this is a really important concept in physiology. Let's say um, a white blood cell, which is made in the bone marrow, a leukocyte, leukocyte. And that um, cell undergoes mitosis too fast. Like it, it, it goes right past the stoppage. It just, you know, something in that DNA replication. And, and, and again, DNA is replicating. I can't even tell you how many times that just happened since I, I hit the stop button on the share. So something can go wrong, right? Every, and it does. So I had Yaya's, you know, she, she could have had six mutations in the last three seconds in that replication. And then that conversion to protein through transcription and translation. So once that mutation winds up in that cell, the cycle could be thrown off and you could have way too much mitosis. So again, I shouldn't have said white blood cells. That's a horrible, horrible situation. And that's what's the, what's cancer of the blood cells called basically? Leukemia. Oh, no, it's leukemia. Yeah, that's, I, that's a horrible condition. I should have, I should have stuck with basal cell carcinoma, which, you know, I can come over with a grapefruit spoon and I can cure it, you know? I'm not downplaying basal cell carcinoma by any means. We probably all had it or are predisposed to it some way because that mitosis of those basal cells is massive. It's constantly, so, you know, you're out in the sun, you're not out in the sun, you could get basal cell carcinoma. So then the mitosis gone wild and it doesn't have a checkpoint like that G zero. So the, the question about how long it takes depends on the cell and depends on the physiology of that machinery that's, replicating DNA, transcribing it to RNA, and translating it to a protein on the ribosome. I think you learned that. I don't care if you got 110 on the exam, you still got to learn it, right? Great job. I'm still amazed. People are so smart. Okay, so that's like an introduction to the cell cycle. So it is a timing, and that was a great question. I couldn't leave that one alone. So it's divided into three main phases. There's interphase, which is you know, during the day when things are going great for 24 hours. And then you have the mitosis, remember my little saying, I'm not good at mnemonics, but I like PMAT, you'll never forget that. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. And technically cytokinesis, which equals a, equals doesn't equal, it means that's division of the cytoplasm. Remember the cytoplasm? That's all the stuff between the nucleus and the plasma membrane. So technically that, that stops in telophase, cytokinesis. Starts in late anaphase though. So that's um, cell division, nucle uh, not nuclear division, it's cytoplasmic division. So mitosis is basically nuclear division and that's where all the goodies are. or replication. So the DNA replicates an interphase, right? In the S phase. And technically the cytokinesis happens during telophase and ana late anaphase. Okay, so remember mitosis is the nucleus, those 46 chromosomes separating and forming two new cells, exactly the same. So that's mitosis, exactly the same. I'm gonna say that a lot. So interphase, is divided into that growth one, synthesis is S and growth two. Growth two is mostly about getting the chromosomes ready to split and replicate. So you have those centrioles. You know, I mentioned that when we talked about the organelles, the centrosome makes the centrioles that are uh, tubular proteins that hold the chromosomes together during mitosis. And here's PMAP, prophase, metaphase, anaphase and telophase. And you can't talk about meiosis until we do mitosis. So let's, I'm not even gonna mention that sperm and egg cell division, not now. <clears throat> okay, so cytokinesis overlaps parts of the mitosis. So that's like between anaphase and ends and telophase. Rock and roll. Here's a picture. You know, you put this as a screensaver on your, on your phone. I should have had it behind me as a virtual background, this helps you see what's going on. So 
here it is. And, and you really should start, let's start interface here. So the question on the test or the questions from the book are gonna say, what's the phase after mitosis? And you're gonna say G1, right? So they, we have centriol, we need centrioles. So, here, so we need centrioles, right, for division. These, those are the spindles that hold the chromosomes together and you can see them replicating within the cytoplasm. So let me ask you this, Smarty Pants, what tissue of the four tissues really don't have a lot of centriole? Hardly any. Is it connective? No, connective, well, connective is a weird tissue. I'm not gonna talk about connective tissue right now. That's got, that's got different types of cells, so that's kind of weird. But let's, let me ask it a different way. Of epithelial and nerve tissue, which one has the least nerve. centriole? Nerve. nerve. Yeah, they, what does it need it for, right? You don't need it. You don't need it. Like It's like me needing hair conditioner. Why would I buy that? Why would I go to like a health and beauty and buy a gallon of hair conditioner? Because what am I conditioning? All right? I get scalp conditioner, but not hair conditioner. So they don't need it because they don't function in that mitotic fashion as epithelial tissue does. So centrioles, yeah, they're important. So that, you know, of course, will slow down mitosis if, if centrioles are needed or not. I like that question. So I think most of the time you're spending here in this part in the S phase where DNA is replicating, nothing could happen without that. So like I said, a lot, lot of things can go wrong if it weren't for enzymes. And, and I mentioned the term last time it was called epigenetics. And unless anybody remember that term, epigenetics, it's very complicated, very complicated epigenetics. So we have a lot of proteins that work as enzymes and proteins, I'm, I'm sorry, enzymes are proteins. They have to be transcribed and translated into a, the protein shape that they are in those primary, secondary and tertiary structures. So if the enzymes aren't correctly made, you're gonna have problems with DNA replication or, gene, or expression of genes, really. So epigenetics has to do with the expression of a gene. Like for example, if you say, say your, your father and maybe your brother have type two diabetes. So type two diabetes is a condition where you can make insulin, you just can't use it. So you're gonna become hyperglycemic. Your blood glucose is gonna go way above 110. So there's a gene in your family for that, type two diabetes. Now, how that's expressed in you depends on probably lifestyle, right? Lifestyle, maybe if, if, you, if you go to Wawa, do we have Wawa around here? and get a huge Coca-Cola. Angelina, it's one of my favorites. I gotta go to Pennsylvania, Jersey to get it. But, um, you know, you get a big soda, but if it's a sugary soda, you keep doing that every day, that's gonna affect the epigenetics of that gene that may be either suppressed or expressed, All right? So having the gene, like I asked you guys last time, you know, is everything genetic or everything environmental? And it's a mix of both. So. How a gene is expressed happens in that phase as well within this cell cycle based on the proteins and enzymes that are creating all these functions. Shoo, that's crazy, right? And you guys did well with, I was looking at the test, you knew what dehydration synthesis was, you studied it, you did the practice questions, you know what hydrolysis is, and now you're talking about enzymes now and how that makes those reactions faster and more organized. So this one that we, we really spend a lot of time in and most cells do, most cells do that undergo mitosis anyway. So here now we're in, in G2. And of course this is the stage or phase I should say before mitosis. And here's your PMAT, here's your PMAT. And then cyanokinesis is the, the final. So let me see if your book's gonna go through every phase or we'll have to spend some time here. Yeah, I can take a closer look. So if you look at the cartoon here, what, what's happening. So this is a cell and interphase. You see the uh, nuclear membrane. You don't see thickening of chromosomes in there. You just see chromatin, right? Like I mentioned, 
Century Oils are ready to go though. They're really bulked up, ready to pack. They're packed and ready to go into mitosis. So P of the P mat is first, prophase. So this is really early prophase here because I could still see a nuclear membrane because in late prophase, that nuclear membrane is gonna disintegrate. And look at the century oils ready to go. They're ready to go. They, the centrosome has been making these beautiful century oils so this cell can divide. So the nuclear membrane will disintegrate in late prophase and then you enter into metaphase. This is the classic, which you see if we, you know, I don't know if you've seen this yet in lab, but you could, this is the easiest one to see, the easiest phase of, meta, of mitosis to see, whether you're looking at an onion or you're looking at a starfish or whitefish or, or a human, whatever, human epithelial cell that you pulled from your cheek. So this is where the chromosomes, now they thickened in prophase. I'm sorry to mention that they're thicker. Look at the difference between interphase and prophase as far as the um, chromatin, because now they're thick chromosomes and they have these little belts around them that hold them together. And now they all line up in the center. They call this the equatorial plate or the metaphase plate. And you can see them all. So they're connected to both poles of the cell centrosome. And then these spindles are your protein microtubule spindles made from the centrioles. So they kind of hold it intact. So metaphase, they line up. Anaphase, they become polar. Now the, the two chromosomes, two chromosomes, all the chromosomes now kind of are pulled apart. So now we're left with what's called chromatid. Like a, like a chromosome is really like one strand and two strand held together by a belt. So in anaphase, the one belt is pulled apart. So it looks like that. So these parts are called chromatids now, chromatids. And it becomes polar. Like you can see now there's two separate ends of the same cell and that membrane is there. So in late anaphase, you, you get what's called a cleavage furrow. So the cleavage furrow means that cytokinesis is beginning. Cytokinesis is beginning. That really happens in late anaphase. This cartoon's not showing you everything. So telophase now, well, look what's coming back, ladies and gentlemen. The nucleus is coming back. So now we have two separate nuclei, still one cell, basically, but with two separate looking nuclei and the nuclear membrane or nuclear envelope is not completed yet. So in cytokinesis, this is gonna split and you're gonna wind up with two exactly same cells as you started with over here. Exactly the same copy, exactly. 46 chromosomes diploid, the genetic material, every chromosome from one to 23 and their pair, their homologous pair are all exactly the same. Can you understand that? And the genetic material is the same. The X and Y in the male is the same on the one pair of sex chromosomes. And male and female, they're all the same. And I mentioned that last time, so I understand what, why that's important for certain conditions physiologically, like um, color blindness, uh, muscular dystrophy, those sex linked conditions are more common in males because they can't cover it up with another gene. So if it's a dominant gene and that's all you have, you're gonna express that. That's hard wiring though. That's not epigenetics. That's, that's gonna happen based on your um, likelihood on if your mother has it, your father has it in that combination. We're not really doing genetics now. We're just kind of talking about how that comes about. So we feeling a little more comfortable about the cell cycle? Professor, and, I have a question. Sure, what's up? Um, so G2, doesn't it have the ability to like, doesn't it have like um, markers to check the accuracy of DNA replication? And if there is yeah. a to to like That's induce right. optosis? That's right. That's right. And we're finding more and more about that. So you have your transcription factors, which are important for letting something go ahead or be expressed and go into mitosis or stop it. So yeah, those, that's part of the checkpoints too. So it's checking to see, make sure that the, everything is going correctly with that part of it. But again, a lot of that happens here in S phase. So but do yeah. 
before it goes into G2, that's really where you have a, a G0. Sometimes they call it an other checkpoint. Okay. Make sense? Yes. So I guess like my question too is like a secondary question, but so do mutations occur due to like a failure almost within that accuracy checkpoint? Yeah, that could happen. Yeah. And it's happening all the time because there's so many different pairings of DNA that can be expressed on those genes, right? Thousands for everything. And, and, and think of all the enzymes that you need. So that's some machinery and it has to be checked before it can go in and go ahead and divide. Make sense? Good point. So interphase, RNA being synthesized, of course, all the time. G1 phase, um, basically the normal day in the cell. Normal day of the cell. Cyclin D moving through the cell in, in, in G1, enzymes. Now, overactivity of the cyclin D has been indicated in some cancers. So that overactivity of that particular enzyme can cause a problem with your DNA. So again, research, we have a lot of research as far as what causes this. The problem is we're doing a lot of tests on, on mice, right? So the clinical trials, again, a lot of cancers can be controlled. And like I said last time, you, you can't treat it like we used to. We can't go in and just cover it up and, and you know, either burn it or cut it out or uh, poison it. You know, you want to try to get to the cells early and that's the trick. You know, this is, it sounds great. Wow. If you find out, you know, there's overactive, overactivity of this and it's going to lead to too much mitosis and prevent some cancers, but you have to find that first cell that I think that's the hardest thing. You have to find that one cell that keeps making copies of itself that has a mutation. Does that make sense? I think how hard that would be, especially for something like leukemia, myeloid leukemia, because the cells are being made so often. Red blood cells, they, they don't have a nucleus, so there's really nothing that we could talk about. Okay. Again, I'm not going to hold you to all of these, but there's a transcription factor, something you should know that can, can stall a gene at these checkpoints, right, and repair the damage. So I think that's what you were asking, right, Claire? I thought it was basically it. So it could repair or promote death of that cell, program death of that cell. So again, that's happening all the time and we're learning more about that. So that's really important, that checkpoint. So everybody can understand that? That's a tough concept. Okay, and if, if it doesn't divide, it's gonna stay modified and, and be that way forever. Like nerve tissue would be more like that. And muscle tissue too. Muscle tissue is not very regenerative. Uh, skeletal and cardiac is not, but smooth muscle is the most regenerative, most mitotic of the muscle types. But again, muscle, skeletal muscle is not undergoing mitosis. Like when your muscles grow, they're growing in size, the cells. They're not growing in number. Yeah. So now if we get, if this cell has passed the checkpoints before and DNA replication can go on normally, hopefully normally, right? So G2 is the condensation, I should not condensation, the thickening of the chromosomes and sister chromatids. Chromatids are the kind of what makes it look like an X. One chromatid, the other chromatid. And they're joined by a central mirror um, it has a different name actually, but we'll see. So there's the centromere. It's like a little belt that holds it together. So this is all strands of very long chains of nucleotides, DNA within this gene. So this is like one chromosome. So each strand of DNA forms different genes and they're locus, which is the location of the gene on a specific chromosome. So there, remember there's 23 pairs of these. So then it has a, a homologous chromosome is in the pairing. So in somatic cells, they basically have the same location. So if you had a, a gene over here, it's exactly like this one and the genes are at the same location. 
all the way through that chromosome. And the genes are made of DNA. The genetics we could talk about forever, you know. So cell death, and here's some, some terminology, and we can keep this simple. So necrosis is where the cell dies pathologically due to uh, deprivation of blood supply. So give me some examples of that, where you'd have necrosis of tissue. This is what we should talk about. What do you think? Which ones? Frostbite. Yeah, yeah, like, like you're, your epithelial, like when you're cold and you're, when you're cold, right? Your body doesn't care about your fingers. It cares about keeping your body temperature up. So you're, so it kind of shunts the blood to the more essential areas like your brain and deeper into your organs and your lungs. So you're, you kind of lose that temperature out in your peripheral. So yes. So what will happen is, of course, you're getting less oxygen. Now you have temperature issue, which is is a hostile environment if the temperature goes really low, and you could get necrotic tissue, and that will you know gangrenous and so forth. That's a really good one, and it could have something to do with blood supply. Doctor Claire, what do you have for me? Give me a good one. Um, Give me a good I was going to ask: Is a stroke an example of this? It is. It is. It is. So. Uh, necrotic tissue is another name. Uh, it's called infarction of tissue, infarction. So yeah, if you have what's called ischemia, ischemia is a low blood delivery. And if it's low blood delivery, it's going to be low oxygen delivery. That's why it's important because the blood's delivering the oxygen. So if that happens in a, in a cerebral vessel, feeding the neurons of your brain, then they will be injured and then they will be, first of all, ischemic, then they'll be injured and then they will undergo necrosis and then they will infarct. So it, that would be death of that tissue. And, and it depends on what part of the brain it could, it could affect your speech on the opposite side of your face or touch on the opposite side of your body or movement of your legs on the opposite side of the body. When we do the nervous system, we'll talk about why that is. So yes, yeah, Rebrovascular accident is a stroke and it's really caused by necrotic infarcted brain tissue. Yes, Chris. Could uh, Alzheimer's also be with necrosis? Or like it is true. Yeah, because all Alzheimer's, and again, you don't find this out until after post-mortem usually, but you do get brain tissue degeneration. So the there's, you know, neurons, of course, if they're not, getting blood supply because there's some type of amyloid plaque that blocks it or a tangle of tau protein or some mutated protein sometimes it's a horrible condition so you're not getting the ions you're not getting the blood supply you're not getting the oxygen so it will it's not like an infarction but it will shrink the actual tissue so you see that post-mortem in people who have alzheimer's and, and i guess as we as um, imaging gets better like a PET scan or a functional MRI. And if you mix the two, or spec scan, which is very detailed physiology of the brain, you might be able to see it before they die, right? Um, so yeah, that's true. That's But that technically is more disuse. Atrophy atrophies brain. And that's kind of hard to swallow because brain neurons really don't, they're not like a muscle that atrophies. It's a little different. So it's, I don't feel that comfortable saying atrophy. Degeneration might be a better word. But what's a really what's a really big place where you have infarcted tissue than necrosis? Pop, you know, I go to Popeyes every day. So this is gonna happen to me like tomorrow. So Popeyes, is that where I eat Popeyes? So let's say you have an embolism. Or you have a blood clot that turns into an embolism. And the embolism is a, a moving clot, it moves away. We're not doing cardio. I don't know if you know about this, but it goes into the heart right? And then the left ventricle pumps out the blood with the clot in it. And then you have to feed the myocardium of the heart, right? That needs its own oxygenated blood. So what would happen if one of your coronary vessels that's feeding oxygen to the myocardium of the heart, what if that gets clogged by an embolism or a clot? Myocardial infarction. Ultimately, yeah. Well, first you're going to have ischemia. 
And then you're going to have hypoxia. Hypoxia means lack of oxygen. That's really the problem. And then you may have necrosis, which lead to myocardial infarction. Heart attack. Heart attack, as they say over in Popeye's down the street here. That's a heart attack sandwich. All right. So this stuff's got to have some meaning. You can't just, you, you talked know. about atrophy. Yeah. Aren't there methods that they can now train cells to, especially brain cells, to regenerate? And in some cases, they actually regrow them? Yeah, some parts of the brain. Some parts of the brain. Like, um, you know, if I take out your, your frontal cortex, which is really where we make our decisions, I'd like to take this class and get an A. But there's a part of your brain, which we found out, called the hippocampus. And it's part of your limbic system. So it, I think we found this out from like um, hummingbirds. So those cells actually can be regenerated. They, I mean, I'm talking about mitosis, like forming new cells. So that is hopeful because when you have Alzheimer's, your hippocampus is one of the places, of course, it's mostly parietal temporal, but the hippocampus is one place that gets obliterated. So you lose your short-term memory because maybe you don't have those new connections. But I think what you're asking is a little different. You're talking about neuroplasticity, right? Well, I was reading that, uh, you know, Alzheimer's patients, um, not only can they do certain exercises to prevent atrophy, but also in some cases they're working on regrowth of. Yeah, yeah, so that's a good question. So really what, what this term neuroplasticity means, like, like, and it works for Alzheimer's too. Let, let's say somebody did have a stroke on one part of their brain. Say the part of my, my left um, prefrontal, not prefrontal, um, precentral gyrus, my frontal lobe, but it affects my right side of my body. Right. So that part is dead. That part is dead for now. I know what you're saying, but so what you could do is, or, or let me give you a better scenario. Let's say, everybody knows Stevie Wonder is? Yeah. Stevie Wonder, genius, right? Genius. And he's blind. Yes. That, that, that's a side of it. Yeah. So, so he has a brain that has no use for vision. Can we agree on that? And, well, and okay. if, you, if you've ever seen a brain, like if you ever opened up a brain, there's more wiring in there for, for vision than any other thing. And, and that's saying a lot. So he, most of his brain is not worried about vision. So he may develop a, a sensory perception, a sensory use, maybe even a motor use because he could now form new pathways because his brain's not really using the, uh, of course this takes work, like, like Katrin's saying, this takes work and, and therapy and being able to use other connections in your brain. And that's plasticity. Now actually taking a hippocampus cells from a hummingbird and implanting it, that's got hope to cause transcription factors that could increase the regeneration of brain neurons. That would be really good. And that, that can happen. Yes. But right now I'm not so sure if we could get it done right away, but it will happen. So neuroplasticity is actually using different pathways from these cells. And this totally goes along with what we're talking about. So I'm not going too far off. Right. So like when you're born, right, we're born, you know the whole story, the Friday night thing, right? Implanted. And then once you're out of there, which sucks, you you have about a year to your, your, your nervous system basically matures in a way or, or develops, except for one place. And, and that's your prefrontal cortex, right? Yeah, yeah you, you're, where you make your executive decisions. Like, should I go to Popeye's or should I go to, uh, what's the other place? Buffalo Wild Wings, right? So... So that area of your brain is not really developed completely until you're in your, your early 20s. And that's true. So the, the thing is, it's, it's like, and which is a good thing. Don't, don't take that as an as a, uh, insult because you might have more pathways that, that can be open. Like, did you ever go skiing or, or sleigh riding? You know, when you, when you go down that same, you're cutting out that same groove all the time. Well, that's kind of what happens to your brain after a while. You're using the same synapses. Like, so I think this goes along with Katrin's question. Like if you're an Alzheimer's patient, patient and all you do is sit at home and watch Hallmark all day, 
and you eat the same thing and you never learn anything new, you never travel, you, you're not making new synapses. Would you agree? You're not taking different paths within that, that mountain. So the synapses are all there to be had. It's just, you have to use them. And that's the way you, you treat early Alzheimer's like MCI, mild cognitive impairment. When you see that, you know, you're in stage two, you know, of course, everybody forgets where their keys are. But if you start feeding your dog the keys, that might be a time to do some MCI therapy, right? <laughs> Whatever it is. And then not just doing the jumble. I mean, that's cool too. Or a crossword puzzle. But what if you just do the same crossword puzzle every day? Yeah, you know, not... that would be, you know, kind of the same thing. Don't you agree? You really, and then you probably, are, most of you people in this class already did this. Learn another language. Try that out for size. Learn another language. That takes a lot of, synapsing don't you think mm -hmm. it's motor speech it's it's cognitive it's decision making so it's it's, it's a, that's the one way i think uh, the best way i believe for treating mild cognitive impairment oh, the necrosis is a big deal i think i think that's what we're preventing in this class right we, we're preventing um disease of course by going uh, you know going off the homeostatic levels that's what you should understand now but preventing, yeah, it's preventing deoxygenated areas because oxygen is making that ATP. So apoptosis is a program cell death, which is appropriate. I think we mentioned this last time when you have the same cell running around for a long time, it's not gonna work as much. And we talked about what telomeres were. So you have to kind of have an idea what the physiology was going on there. It's death I light. Have a question. That's a tough one. Yes, question, Lexi? Um, just really quick. So for the necrosis, is it like besides the examples that we went over, would it also be like um, untreated diabetes where like you have to get yeah. or yeah. like what about like Raynaud's? Uh, Raynaud's is a, is a sympathetic issue. Okay. Yeah, that's so more um, like where your, your sympathetic nervous system doesn't activate enough to, to get the blood to where it needs to go. So that so has diabetes is a do. great example yeah. because it, hurt, it affects your peripheral uh, arteries and vessels. So like if, if you know somebody who has control, uncontrolled uh, diabetes, they usually have some peripheral, like in their feet and toes, they have a necrosis of their tissue because okay. the, the basically glucose is very toxic in high levels and it destroys your capillaries, number one. And, and it affects, of course, your ion channels and it will destroy tissue and cause necrosis especially in the periphery yeah that's a good example that's a really good example diabetes comes up a lot in your book they, they love to talk about diabetes and it's really good though so death ligands this sounds really scary that's like a, a, a something that's going to hit into a, a receptor that's made for that death ligand all right, and market for destruction. So this, that sounds immune, doesn't it? That sounds immune, like a, a ligand mediated um, phagocytosis or something, right? So that's what that means, a death ligand. If the death ligand is not part of your body, that's big trouble. Okay, intrinsic DNA damage. I think we kind of understand that damage or damage to the machinery that makes it cancer um, overproduction of the nuclei, too much mitosis, infection from a, an antigen, some type of antigen that is COVID, a bacteria, something that's not supposed to be there, bad bacteria. Of course, we have thousands of good bacteria. Oxidative stress, we're going to talk about that probably next time. Oxidative stress, like free radicals. And when all these reactions, normal reactions, like a normal reaction where when a red blood cell dumps oxygen into tissue, you have some oxidation that goes on that has to be immediately taken care of, right? And you have the pH, right? You learned about pH, you know what the pH of blood should be, you know what base is or uh, acid. So that kind of stress put on the cells over and over has to be buffered in a way. And it kind of like oxidative stress has to be buffered in a way to, to reduce that oxidation. Antioxidants, right? A, C, and E, and other vitamins, nicotinic acid and flavonoids, 
really important. And that's really good research there. You know, something that's more natural with less side effects. I wish they'd come out with that. So I have to stop, stop taking Advil once a month because every drug has a side effect. Yeah, so the transcription factor, P53, knocked out mice. When they knocked that out, and I've done this, you take out the gene and then you can study, see how these cells undergo this uh, excess mitosis or checkpoint destruction. Knockout mice means you, you take the mice's um, genetics, right? And you take their cells and you replant them in after you remove the genes or the transcription factors, right? So then you, then you can, mice are good. Of course, mice and, and mice share 99% of our genes, but there's some slight differences, right? Right, there's some slight differences that like, like their gestation period is much faster, right? Their lifespan is much shorter. So it's not as good as that sounds. Well, well, it's, I mean, even though I love mice, but, and, and what you get out of it, but you know, has it cured anything yet? I mean, it, it's a big help. Don't get me wrong. You learn, you studied the scientific method. You know that ultimately you have to do clinical trials with medications or with epigenetics now. It's a lot safer too. So at least it, we, it started us in the right um, place. We're using rats and, and mice, little furry mammals, big help. So you, you knock out the genes or knock out mice means you, you've removed the genes and let those cells undergo mitosis for um, sometimes up to three generations in the mice, right? So let's get back to the nuts and bolts, the stuff that's gonna be on the test and hopefully learning some of this stuff. So prophase, prophase, right? The chromosomes are thickened and the nucleolus goes bye-bye and the nuclear membrane starts to degenerate. Centrioles starting to do their work and P of the P mat. And you start to see the findle, spindle fibers, which are microtubular proteins, kind of like the same proteins that make up cilia, flagella, and cytoskeleton. So that's really important in Alzheimer's, by the way. Let's talk about that. You want to talk about Alzheimer's. You know, that's really the problem in Alzheimer's. It's, it's, it's the machinery making those microtubular proteins. The enzyme's the wrong enzyme. And it cleaves the protein at, at, at a, not the right segment. And you get the placking. That's what Alzheimer's is, basically. Then you get degenerated brain. You get loss of memory, dementia, right? So why can't we fix that? I don't I have no idea. By the end of the semester, I better have an answer. Claire, yes. Um, I'm just curious back to last like units, but um, in terms of these right. cells and their expressions, is this where CRISPR Cas9 can possibly come in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that those two women are my heroes, you know, um, and, th and, and March is Women in Science Month. They should be all over it. So yes, yeah, so yeah, you got it. So yeah, so CRISPR would would do it mostly in the in the um, S phase though, mostly in the S phase. So CRISPR is a way that they could splice the gene and remove it, like they could take out the a gene that's causing something like Alzheimer's, like the seventeenth chromosome that gene number. I'm sorry, gene number seventeen, and they they could splice it back together and get those palindromic repeats over and over. And, and, ha and it works, it works. You could, but again, you have to find it. You have to find it first. You have to get it early. Maybe even before you're even born. Think of that, you know? So yeah, CRISPR, and again, that's completely ethical. There's no, not, not that I'm concerned about, I'm not talking about eth ethics, but I'm just saying I am concerned, but I'm saying that it's not, it's something that it's not like, you know, building a better sheep, you know what I mean? Or having a sheep or Barbara Streisand paying $40,000 to have the exact same dog that died. You know, this is something that's going to be used to, um, to treat things before they happen, like leukemia. If you can, if you could get rid of that gene and splice it out and get better palindromic repeats, you know, more clean, if you, so to speak. Of course, you got to work on your epigenetics too. You're not free just because you're, you've undergone a CRISPR treatment. And that's black market, right? This black market, CRISPR is these brilliant guys, like work for NASA, like the guy who, who uh, designed that rover thing that went to Mars. Not him, but there's one guy actually went on his own and started 
people were sending them their DNA in the mail and he was using CRISPR and mailing it back. So he's in jail now for, for black market CRISPR. Yeah, that was a cool story. So those ladies are my heroes. I just can't remember their names all the time. So metaphase, that's the easiest one. Remember the chromosomes kind of line up in the middle. Easiest to see. And you got a picture, um, 46 of those. So they line up in the center. And the spindles are, you know, of course you have the centrioles and the spindles are going through all of those. So that's the hallmark of metaphase. Hopefully you get, oh, here we go. This is the one I was looking for before. I was hoping again. So you got the cartoon in the real cell. The real cell. Beautiful. Maybe there's somebody's cheek cells. Who knows? So this is great. Um, hopefully I'll use pictures for you on the next test for cell cycle. So interphase, this is our just regular 23 hours. Let's stick to that. Just makes it easier. Right? So nuclear envelope intact in the real histology. You see chromatin, not really chromosomes thickening there. Um, in prophase, you have disintegration of the nuclear membrane. So this, these are two usually hard to differentiate, but look for the nuclear membrane if you've done this. So the chromosome is starting to thicken. Can't really see the spindle fibers in the histology. And then you look at metaphase, which again, any cell kind of looks like this, whether it's a plant cell or um, an animal cell like this, or a eukaryotic cell. And then you have anaphase, which you could see the chromatids separating in the cartoon. Centrioles would be here in that. They kind of call this a polar cell or the polar phase, so PMAT. And then you have your telophase. We have the cleavage furrowing. So it, this is a tough one because it looks like, this, you know, some people in some histology exams I've given say, it looks like two different cells in metaphase. But that's telophase, and that's a cleavage furrow. That's a tough one. So that is the visual. I like that. That helps. So this pretty much tells you what happens. Cytoplasma is divided through cytokinesis. That's the term for that. And the chromosomes lengthening. They can so nice pictures. Again, telophase is a tough one. Right? I'm with you on that. So the centrosome and located usually near the nucleus and a non-dividing cell, it's not gonna make centrioles though. So two centrioles are in the center of the centromere and they're building the spindle fibers, pericentriolar material around the centrioles. Maybe we'll get a picture of that. Um, not much to talk about here. Now, remember I said cilia is kind of made of, and the proteins are made, the microtubules, hundreds of centrosomes form to become cilia, really, it's the same proteins. That's a pretty good example right there, what could happen. It's like cinnamon six, doesn't it? The centrosome in the cell, the city of the cell. So the telomeres we talked about, um, again, the with time, these will shorten and activate the factors that may arrest the cycle. Senescence means, um, and it's like senile. You heard of the word senile, where getting older, right? Getting older, senescence of a cell. So this is true. You know, the, as the telomeres get shorter, it, it leads to programmed cell death a little quicker. Um, and that's especially with cells that undergo a lot of mitosis, like the bone marrow, which is white blood cells, right? So we need telomerase. That's the enzyme. We'll talk about enzymes next time. You always, if you see an ACE at the end or an IN at the end, um, and pepsin, trypsin, cyclin, and ACEs, usually that's a protein enzyme. And they can only just uh, divide for so long, kind of talked about this last time, and you start losing uh, triplets of DNA. 
So each time it replicates, it, yeah, it's, that sounds pretty scary, but it takes time. Don't worry yourself about it. Keep your epigenetics good. It's part of life. So activating the transcription factor, which induces cell arrest. So this is, you know, here's a here's the thing. If you, you should be asking a question like, what, what's a question you should be asking right now? Especially when you're looking at an old guy like me. What, what should you be saying? Kat, you with me on this one? Not with you. How do we stop aging? Um, why don't we just get this transcription factor? We don't, it's, why don't we treat aging as a disease, don't you think? Well, aging is a disease. So let's treat it. There is a professor. I got a vaccine for COVID. Why can't I get a vaccine for aging? Like a transcription shot. There is a guy, actually. His name is David Sinclair. David Sinclair. I know him very well. He wrote that book about aging. And, exactly. it, and he mentions all this stuff. Like, like right. it's a disease. He, he says, says it's a disease. Right. He says Columbia it. University. I've I read about it. And it's a right. great idea. He's a great guy. And he says his father, you know, is doing great. Right. He's going to do great, but right. a lot of variables in that, right? Uh, yeah, but that's his only project. He's, it's a uh, great project, though, isn't it? I love it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, yeah, he's a great guy. And he talks a lot about the epigenetics. Yes. And his whole thing is not what I said before. You don't treat the disease like we used to. Treat the person as an individual. Right. Based on their genetic profile. And now right. CRISPR is really going to help that. And... um. Senescence, treating senescence is what his thing is, right? Uh, senescence, and then he recommends uh, metformin. Um, yeah, like most doctors are taking a drug, and we'll talk about that when we talk about um, glucose metabolism, right? Uh, metformin. Right. Most doctors now are taking metformin because it's it's going to prolong their lives. And he says you should drink red wine. Yeah, a little red wine and plant based diet too. Plant-based diet and yeah, so, intermittent fasting. So by, yeah, intermittent fasting. So so by the summer, I think I'm going to move from Popeye's to like the local um, Soho plant-based place. What do you think? Yeah, you get it last like two months and then you're like, <laughs> yeah. It's a, it makes a lot of sense to me though, doesn't it? It makes a lot of sense. But I love that book. I love not, it. I it's it not good. entirely sustainable. Yeah. Yeah, he was lived in Australia, right, Sinclair? As he is now, I think, at Harvard. Harvard now, but he was he was brought up in, in uh, Australia. Yes, somewhere else. His his wife and him both work in the same um, yeah. environment, and that's his thing. Um, he was um, responsible for the discovery of taking um, in, in pill form the essence of red wine yeah, a, yeah. what is it called um reservatrol so that we can buy reservatrol in pill form, pill form. that is beca yeah. because of his very very natural oriented but he, but he still believes in medication though it's not completely um no, not completely not but completely it's very good. Very, he also believes in only eating once or twice a day yeah yeah small low calorie intermittent fasting very good right. so it's very interesting you know he our, says, make our body work can, harder make our body work can harder actually, it, so. you can reverse aging yeah yeah no he's he's sure about it he is sure about it and i love it so let's move on that was really There's good we'll talk about him from time to time a lot actually. of YouTube videos too if somebody wants yeah, i never to... watched the videos that's cool yeah no the videos are great yeah excellent excellent i'm happy you read that book Okay, so hypertrophy and hyperplasia. Hypertrophy is the like a muscle, like the heart muscle too, grows in size because it's usually overworked. Hyperplasia is excess amounts of cells, increase of cell growth. So the number of cells, hyperplasia and hypertrophy, it's like the opposite of atrophy, hypertrophy, hyper means more so that's increasing the cell size and it's not only muscle skeletal muscle it's also cardiac muscle which sometimes is good or normal sometimes it's pathological so here's the meiosis 
Now, meiosis, I'm not going to go too deep into this because we're going to do some reproduction. So meiosis is the nuclear cell division of the sperm and the egg. And remember, the sperm and the egg are haploid. And that's just N. 23 chromosomes, right? So the homologous chromosomes, again, 23 pairs. I have one pair of sex chromosome. That's diploid. But all meiosis starts with a diploid cell. That's the kind of difficult thing. So basically meiosis is cutting everything in half. So this, this is what you should take away if I don't go any further. The outcome of mitosis was two diploid cells exactly the same genetically. Where we're gonna say meiosis, the outcome is four haploid cells completely different genetically. Can we understand that? Just That's the real takeaway right now from meiosis. Again, when we do reproduction, it'll make more go a little deeper. So there's two steps. So there's PMAT1, like P, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase 1, and then 2, prophase, metaphase, anaphase 2. So there's two phases of meiosis. And where does it happen? In the ovaries, making the oocytes and in the testes making the spermatozoa, spermatogonia, which is immature sperm. This is a nice little mapping out of pictures. Here's all your chromosomes, you have 22. Like if I say uh, chromosome 17, we found the uh, lipoprotein gene for predisposing you for Alzheimer's. We're talking about the 17th chromosome. So there's 22 pairs of autosomes and there's one pair of um, sex chromosomes. So the Y will make this genome a male, right? This is male. So we can see them and then map out the DNA, which is really amazing. So we call it meiosis one and meiosis two. So this is a little hard to follow. We're not gonna go too deep here. So again, P, prophase one, homologous chromosomes, which means they're the same. We start up as a diploid pair. And, but here's what happens. Parts are swapped. That's, not, that's, a, big, that's a big thing. So the, the information crosses over from one chromosome to another. They're not exactly homologous, right? Because they're sharing now and, and the, the genes are gonna be different from somatic cells at least. Metaphase one looks like mitosis. They line up in the center. And now we have maternal and paternal chromosomes are shuffled, which means the genes are shuffled. So meiosis is a mixing. They call it synapsing of genes. And they form these tetrads, which hopefully we'll see. So it kind of crosses over, like you look at different colors and the synapse area. So the genes are actually crossing over to these two homologous chromosomes. So pro, uh, prophase one, and then they pair, chromosomes crossing over. So the genetic material is crossing over. So anaphase one, homologous chromosomes are pulled apart. Telophase one, they're separated in two daughter cells with 23 chromosomes each. Now we're not done yet. So it's still, you know, a diploid cell. It hasn't finished. Meiosis one hasn't finished yet. So the end of meiosis one, you're going to have four cells and then you're going to have four more cells that are produced. I'm sorry, you're going to have two cells after meiosis one, and then you're going to have four cells completely different. So the end of the two phases of meiosis, then you'll have the four completely different cells. It's very easy in, in the male sperm. It's just a little more, much more complicated in the female oocyte or oogenesis. So it's reducing, and each cell has now has half as many chromosomes. So meiosis is really cutting in half. And of course, that's necessary for proper se sexual reproduction. Like you know, on a Friday night, that 23 chromosome sperm is going to fuse with the 23 chromosome oocyte, and that you're going to get a proper zygote. Right, and you'll have completely mixed genetics, of course, because it's mother and father, right? 
So crossing over and shuffling, and I call that recombination of genes and it creates diversity, which is really important in genetics. That's why we're here so long. So mysis, meiosis two, again, PMAT two. Okay, so phases, prophase through telophase. And again, sister chromosomes line up in the center and they're pulled apart resulting, and here's the result, four cells that are all haploid, which is 23 chromosomes. Only the sperm, only the egg. So here it is, tetrad, yeah, there's the word tetrad where they kind of line up and then they synapse, they cross over the genetic material, mostly in metaphase one. Then you have two daughter cells and then they undergo meiosis two and you wind up with four haploid cells. That's the outcome. That's what I need you to know now, today, right? And this breaks down the stages of meiosis. Um, and that's about it for what I need you to know about meiosis, the, the outcome. So in, in the male, it's really simple. It's very simple. You have a spermatogonia, which is a very immature uh, sperm cell. It undergoes, first it undergoes mitosis, to be honest with you. And then you have two daughter cells that are going to undergo meiosis. And you're going to wind up with four haploid cells. It's straightforward, right? Straightforward. Now in the female, it's a little different. The fee, anybody know anything about this? I don't know anything about females, first of all. It's very complicated. So you have mitosis, you have oogonia, which when you say gonia, that means a very immature, like, and when females are, you know, when they're in the uterus, when they're embryos, they're making oogonia, like thousands of them. But you really only get four to 500 viable oocytes that could be fertilized in your lifetime. It's crazy, right? But that's a miracle of evolution. You really, that's a big deal, you know, reproduction, passing the, those genes down, some of them not so good, right, to the next generation. But thanks to David Sinclair and uh, CRISPR, the two ladies, well, I forget their name all the time. It's, it's hopeful. So in the female, you, you start meiosis one, you start meiosis one, early on, like as a child. And meiosis one doesn't even complete until you go through puberty. So basically meiosis in an oocyte is stalled from the time you're a born to, the, to your puberty. So, and then it's, you start meiosis two, and then that stalls. So meiosis two doesn't even complete until Friday night when the sperm enters the cell, enters the oocyte. Then you form an ovum, which now can divide. And now you could complete meiosis too. And you get, you know, you get the zygote, you get the polar body, right? Ultimately, second polar body. So you get two polar bodies, one ovum, and then zygote out of that whole deal. So it's really, um, and, and the oocyte, of course, is the viable and the secondary oocyte. But we'll do that in reproduction. So I don't want to go too far into that. But it's very complicated when it comes to the female meiosis. But it's the same outcome, basically, genetically. But the ovum is really going to become the primary zygote at the end. But sperm, straight up, straight up, four sperm cell over and over and over. I, I, you, males get I can't even tell you how many sperm in their, their whole life. With a female, like I said, only that period of time when they're ovulating, which, you know, it stops at menopause. So it starts at menarche, which is you know, puberty and the onset of menses, you know, start ovulating. And then you do that for a bunch of years and it's berries, well, how that's gonna, when that's gonna stop. And the stoppage of ovulation is called menopause. So you can't, produce and release a viable secondary oocyte, which is haploid. So it's pretty complicated, but it looks like the end of the semester we're talking about reproduction. So I just want you to know my, mitosis as best as you can right now, and then know what meiosis is and know the difference, all right? So that's it for the cell. We can move on to enzymes and get really into physiology now.
and I'm going on a plant-based st diet starting now, ending at midnight. So I'm fasting from plant-based food. Kate, is that okay, Catlin? <laughs> All right, any questions? We're good, thanks for staying so long. I know you're burnt out from that really difficult test you took today, you guys crushed it. I think the average was above 89. Crushed it, crushed it, let's keep that up. Learning outcome, right, learning outcome. Keep the questions coming too. All right, so everybody have a good night. Good to see you, I'll catch you next week. There's no like achievement day or anything next week, no spring break, no reading day or constitution day. Or... Don't forget, Women in Science Month coming up. Get prepared. Big one. Right? Uh, so have... Yes. So um, I was wondering if if we knew, because I, I remember Professor Shibani gave us a quiz on Monday, right? The, the yeah. quiz on Monday had to do with cell cycle, what we went over to with today. And when we took the quiz, I was like, did I miss something? And covering the, you know, so I just wanted to know if I was... Uh, how to keep up, how to make sure that I'm kept up with the, with what she's going to put on the quiz, just in case. Well, she's get... quizzing you on something that she didn't do? Is that what you're saying? So, so the cell cycle, we learned the prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Good. That was on the quiz on Monday. Good. But we had a lecture. So I don't know. I'm not sure what you're asking. Like, why, yeah, like, why I, did I, you have I, a quiz I, before the lecture? I thought the same thing. Yeah. The, the quiz had the material we just went over and no. But you didn't get it in lab. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, we, we didn't, we didn't get it in lab, no. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you there. So it's going to be on my exam, too. Oh, I know. Yeah, that's why I'm saying I, I don't want to, like, show up for, for lab on Monday again and we have to take a quiz and then it's, like, something we need to cover the lecture. Or... I, 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 yeah, I don't, I don't understand that either. Yeah. All right. Quiz and lecture. Maybe she assumed you did it in lecture. You got to talk to her about that. that but that's what I'm saying, yeah. So, okay. So I'll send her an email just to make sure that you know... Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, you should be doing that in lab, though, right? You're doing this, the cell cycle in lab. So the quiz, I don't think she covered. She didn't cover the prophase, metaphase, anaphase stuff in lab. I'll take I a don't... look. She might have it somewhere in Blackboard, and we missed it. Maybe. How yeah. did you take it, Chris? How did you take the quiz? Because we couldn't connect with the quiz on Monday. Some people, some people couldn't connect with the quiz on Monday. I was able to connect. Some people didn't even have that breakout. Course. Yeah, I didn't have that, you're right. Yeah. But that was only some people. I had mine, which is why I was able to take the, the quiz. Yeah, I have no answer for that. So I, I don't know what to tell you. I'm not going to ask you any questions that were done in lab if I didn't do it in lecture. So. Okay, yeah. So I just didn't know if, if you guys, if there was like an assumption because. No. You know, I just, I don't, the only reason I say it, professor, is because I want to be prepared for class. So if I'm, if I'm like assuming that there's something that we covered in lecture, but then she pops up something in quiz that you didn't. Yeah, I know. I saw. I saw on Blackboard she had the cell cycle there. Yeah. You're responsible for that if she puts it up. Not for me, of course, but for her lab. Her lab. Oh, okay. And you're responsible for that, especially if you had like a snow out, right? You, you guys were snowed out one time. Yeah. Yeah. So you're responsible. Right, it's right there on I, Blackboard. Yeah. I saw it. Okay. Um, no problem. All right. I assume uh, that that was, and I think it's a good assumption that. She needed you to know that for a quiz. But it's only one quiz. So I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah, I know. I know. She's I, cool well, about uh, it. Just, um, yeah. But it, it has nothing, to, you know, she would never, um, you know, quiz you on something she's assuming that I'm doing in lecture. She might. Okay. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's going to help. That's fine. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure. It's like, I help have... us. like she, if she did, and she did post it, it then it's going to help us. Like when we do our lecture exam. Right. So the reason why I asked that professor is because I only have a finite amount of time in between work that I can study and yeah. like yeah. show lecture. So I got to make sure that I'm prioritizing it right, and I want to know how the how the system. Yeah, works. no. If anything's on Blackboard, you're responsible for, it, especially in lab. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, for sure. All right. Thank you, professor. No sweat. No sweat. Um,